Right. Welcome everybody, how are you? Um, my name is Will Kent, I work at the Wiki Education Foundation, and it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Lee, who is a digital media strategist. Uh, you might have seen him present uh, earlier today at our conference. Um, and he is a grantee, a Knight Foundation grantee at the Smithsonian. He also wrote the Wikipedia Revolution, and he'll be speaking to us about Wikidata today. So please give Andrew a round of applause and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for hanging in uh, with more Wikidata. I love the folks who are interested in more Wikidata. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you can go to the slides. So bit.ly slash ld4-2019-wikidata2. Um, or you can scan that QR code and you'll get that. So uh, if I were to describe Wikidata in one line, uh, it's like this. So if I were to describe Wikidata in one line, it would be this, the evolution of the Wikimedia or Wiki movement towards the ultimate free linked open database. Right, and by now, most of you probably know the basics of Wikidata, but just to make sure you all know, this is the one-page guide that Rob talked about earlier today. So this is something that we curate um, from the Wikidata community because there's so much to learn about Wikidata, it's hard to find it in one place. So this is a good kind of 10,000 foot view of where the tools are and where the, the best uh, resources are. And this has been translated into, I think, nine other languages at this point, so you can look on the main page there for other language translations of that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have an Etherpad right now. But if anyone wants to start an Etherpad, you, you're welcome to do that. Um, so what we're gonna do is not really dive into much of the early part, but really think about the last part of this, which is queries and tools, because you probably by now kind of understand what a Wikidata item is, and then the real complication comes when you want to look at large swaths of Wikidata. And if I want to add this next item, how does it fit into the whole of what's in there, Wikidata? That's not always an easy thing. Right? How do you figure out what has been done already and how complete is a data set? How well modeled is a data set in Wikidata? Uh, so just the one minute tour of Wikidata, we, you probably know that triples are what we talk about when we look into RDF databases. So whether you call it subject, predicate, object, or item, property, value, or I just often like to say thing, relationship to something else. These are what we call triples. And then you will find in a Wikidata item, labels, descriptions, aliases, um, for example, at the top of this Wikidata item, and then here are the triples, right? So the first part is Q11268, and then you have the predicate of instance of, and then bicameral legislature, or part of the federal government, or country, United States of America, right? So these triples are held in the Wikibase software that runs Wikidata. Okay, so the thing that we want to try to plumb down into is not just the QPQ, but where does it fit in the whole? So how, how many people here have used Wikidata Graph Builder before? Anyone? No one? Good. So you're going to learn something brand new today. So this is an example of the output from Wikidata Graph Builder. So when you're looking at an item, where does it fit in the entire web of what has been created with a Wikidata? All right, so just to explain a little bit of how the graph database differs from how we deal with relational databases. This is a good example of a traditional database, right? This is like one table holds the information about artists or painters, and another table holds the information about paintings. And if you want to try to come up with a list of all the artists and their birthdays and their paintings, you need to do a join or some kind of manipulation here, right? So the nice thing about relational databases is that the schema is well known and well laid out. You cannot have tables unless you know what the columns are, right? Um, so the great thing is there's some order, there's some understanding for how this has been done. Someone has made a decision, it is in a rigid table structure. Um, the problem though is changes can be complex. If you want to add something else or modify how something is done, you need to get buy-in from everyone who's had a hand in making those tables, right? And then searching these relationships can be very expensive. You want to do three, four, five table joins, anyone who's done Relational databases knows that can be really expensive and really long. So the difference with RDF databases is that relationships are kind of what we call first class object. Right? So relationships are stored explicitly in graph databases. So it kind of grows organically like this. So that's why graph databases are almost perfectly made for the wiki community. We kind of start small and we kind of grow it this way. And we might decide to go that way, but we might also decide to do two things simultaneously. And that actually is something you can do with a graph database, right? So we can kind of take any shape and grow as needed depending on who is doing it, whether it's a librarian or um, a, an art historian, there's different ways that it can grow. 
So the upsides of having a graph database are that RDF triples make for very flexible and fast ways to do things. It's suitable for this b-ball, just fix it wiki culture that we have. And then multiple parallel ontologies can actually exist in this kind of database. The downsides are there is no real schema to be defined, right? So you have to kind of discover it. So the schema on the fly system can make things very inconsistent and difficult when you try to add things to the database. It's hard for newcomers to understand, right? There's a reason why this room is full. It's kind of like, I don't know where to start when I want to add my thing. And the exact same reason why it's an upside is also why it's a downside. Multiple parallel ontologies can exist and they may never be resolved well. So that's kind of the, the scenario where you see several domains of knowledge in Wikidata where they're kind of like on different planes of existence but we are not sure we can reconcile all of them in any easy way. Right, so as we said this morning, Wikidata has more than 56 million items. The nice thing is that these searches across these 56 million items are really fast. Okay, so your very basic kind of uh, query that you might have is show me all legislatures, so question mark legislature that you have in your query, is instance of, so WDT colon P31, uh, bicameral legislature. So this query says show me all legislatures that are instances of a bicameral legislature. And when you do that, this is a slightly older query here, but 52 million items are traversed and it comes back in less than a second. Okay, that's pretty powerful even if you're, um, you know, skeptical about performance. Less than a second for 50 some million items, pretty darn impressive. Um, so as a metadatabase, Wikidata doesn't need to hold all this data, so a lot of the identifiers we talked about this morning point to other places. Sometimes this data is ingested into Wikidata, like birthdays, country of birth, but oftentimes Wikidata will say, we don't want to hold that data because I'm sure it will change. It's better to point to the database where that's going to have the fresher information, right? So that's federation of data rather than copy of data. And we actually, I'm sorry, so we actually have 44 other Sparkle endpoints that are callable from the Wikidata query, right? So you don't have to do the whole declaration at the top. You can actually say like AAT colon, and that goes to get the AAT and the different types of uh, prefixes that we have. So we already have federation endpoints integrated into Wikidata query. Another nice thing about Wikidata is there's consistency and balance checking, right? So any kind of property, you can say that property must be a subclass of X or the identifier must have a format of starting with an alphanumeric um, uh, character and then three digits afterwards, right? So you can actually have quality checking right at the point of data entry um, or ingesting because we have these format constraints and other type of uh, type constraints in Wikidata. So we are talking this morning with Rob about some of the things that you probably want to turn on in Wikidata to make your life easier. So one of the challenging things about any of our Wiki projects is that if you open up Wikidata vanilla, so I'm opening a private browser here, so I, I'm not logged in, and you go to a random item, so we go ahead and say random item here, it's pretty plain vanilla here, right? There's no bells and whistles, and that's one of the downsides of our community is that we're very conservative, so the vanilla, no bells and whistles experience of Wikidata is what everyone gets. If you really want something useful, you should turn on the gadgets in Wikidata. So I'll show you three that I highly recommend everyone turn on. So if you are logged into Wikidata, you can turn these on and make your experience much nicer. So one of them is, um, let me show you here because it's not always obvious to everyone. So if you are logged into Wikidata, you'll notice that your name pops up right there. And then we have the preferences button right there. If you click on preferences, you'll get a, another page of preferences. And then way over on the right, so it's easy to miss, is a gadgets button. If you click on gadgets, you will now get a, whoops, uh, let me show you that in real time. So if you go to preferences and gadgets, you'll get kind of a dizzying list of very badly described features, <laughs> which are awesome, but they don't really tell you everything about them, right? So um, you can, I highly encourage you to play with them. I'm just gonna tell you about three I think everyone should turn on. So one is, the function to add a query next to every single statement, which is kind of cool. So this one is called Easy Query, so you'll see it in the checkbox there. If you turn on Easy Query, you'll have a dot, dot, dot next to each statement in a Wikidata item. And the cool thing is you click on that, it'll immediately do a Wikidata query and say, okay, here's what I found in Wikidata, which is really nice. So in this case, you probably don't want to say instance of human and bring back every human, 
But if you're looking at place of burial, Brookwood Cemetery, I said, ah, who else was buried at Brookwood Cemetery? And I clicked on that, and you know, a list of 40, 50 people came back, which is really convenient. Right? It shows you what kind of folks are buried there. You can also punt out into the full Wikidata query. So there's a button at the bottom that says, bring me to the full Wikidata query, and you can get the full featured set of tools there. So I think this is really nice just to have this little thing. It's pretty unintrusive. It's just always there that you can click on. So this is easy query. The other thing I would re highly recommend is recoin. So this starts getting into the, I'm looking at this item, how does it fit into the whole? And the nice thing about recoin, which is the relative completeness indicator, is that it looks at things like, what is the item an instance of? And then it looks across all the other instances of those things, and then it says, oh, by the way, like 90% or here, no, 55% of all those things have this property set. You should probably set this property too. Right, so it just immediately contextualizes what the item you're looking at is about compared to all the other items of similar type in Wikidata. So you can actually, without having to scroll down, you can actually go ahead and click on the plus sign and just add material used. So this is a cool example. I saw this yesterday at the Museum of Fine Arts down the street here. This is a, what is it? A um, painting by Picasso. Picasso, it's a Picasso painting, but done in the style of Toulouse-Lautrec. So it's kind of like an homage to Toulouse Trek, but I saw it's like, that's so weird. As a Picasso, just kind of like, yeah, I'm gonna paint this uh, because of my friend Toulouse Trek. So I thought it was quite interesting, and you go into this painting, and I saw, oh, it's not very complete, but you can actually complete it by hitting the plus sign and adding genre, material used, country of origin, all these things, if you know that. All right, so this is an easy way to just, in context of that item, look to see what the properties are that are set for this type of thing. And then the other thing that's interesting is duplicate references. I think Rob showed you briefly this morning. So if you're looking at a statement and it says stated in VIAF, right, or integrated authority file, you can actually hit the copy button and then it's kind of like a copy buffer. It says we're memorized that, that uh, reference. You go to another statement within the same item, you just hit insert reference and boom, 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 you can replicate a reference down the page. All right, so you should obviously check to make sure that place actually verifies the statement that you're putting in there, but this is kind of nice to quickly copy a reference between Wikidata items. Okay, so I encourage you to play with the other gadgets that are there, but these three I think everyone should have. Easy query for quick access to Wikidata query, Recoin, relative completeness indicator, a really nice way just to show how does this item compare to the other filled in items in Wikidata, and then duplicate references. Any questions or any other folks who have gadgets of their own that they might recommend? Yes? If you're installing your own instance of Wikibase, are these gadgets available to plug in? That's a good question. I don't know if Vanilla Wikibase has any of this stuff where you need to just insert something. I don't think they're available out of the box. Right. But they're all free software. You can just grab them and install them very easily by uh, adding them to the configuration file. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, so in addition to these gadgets, I'm glad you asked that, there's a bunch of like custom user scripts out there, and that's kind of like lifting the hood of your car and like pulling wires, it's like putting custom JavaScript into your profile. There's some really nice scripts there. Yeah, they avoid the warranty. Yes, they, they really like do some weird things at times. Powerful but weird things, so yeah, take a look and, and see if you like those. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the querying tools and things that you can use on top of Wikidata Query now. So, we didn't get that much time to look into Wikidata Query this morning, but just to recap, this is your basic Wikidata Query box here. Um, go to query.wikidata.org. It is, I like, Asaf has this nice phrase, it is superficially similar to SQL. Um, so it's kind of like it, but you're probably better off forgetting what you know about SQL and just going in fresh with this idea of patterns and matching rather than the select statements of SQL. Right? And it's one of the busiest endpoints on the internet. I did some math last night, and I think there are 80 Sparkle requests per second on Wikidata. <coughs> yeah, and that's already kind of a little bit on the modest side. You should count on 100 to 120 per second at peak time, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so how do you operate this? Well, I highly encourage you to go to the examples button. There's some really beautiful examples under here, so go ahead and play. Uh, take a look at these just to get your feet wet. I almost never start a Wikidata query from scratch. I start with cat all the time, and just to get all the structure around it, and then I customize the middle part, right? So I think Rob showed this to you the other day, or the other, this morning. So I go to query.wikidata.org. Typically what I will do is go to examples, insert my cat, and this is a big joke in the community, please delete cats, because 
We've got so many queries that are not about cats, but people forget to edit that <laughs> comment line. So I'm gonna go in there and say, um, yeah, I'm gonna put in something different. I'll say uh, horses. Right? So the secret here is when you go ahead and go in there, it says house cat, I can delete that. And already one trick, if you didn't know, and it used to be prominent, I don't know why it isn't there, hitting control space as your shortcut. You go in here and you type in horse, and you hit control space, and it's gonna match against anything that it finds in the labels of Wikidata. And hopefully it's gonna bring up the one you want, domesticated work animal. I'm gonna go ahead and say that, and I'm gonna go ahead and hit the blue button to run it, and it's gonna come back with quite a number of horses. So there's 4,653 named instances of horses. So these are not horse breeds, these are horses with a name and are known. And there's a reason why there's 4,800 or well, 4,600 horses and only like less than 200 cats. Anyone want to guess why? Why are there more, way more horses? Racing. Racing, exactly, right? Every winner of, you know, Churchill Downs, anything else. So there are named horses, not so many racing cats out there, a lot more racing <laughs> horses. All right, so we've got this as your example here and we pretty much. Go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, oh, we have to do occupation. So this is the question, like, are, are you an instance of a librarian or are you occupation librarian? They're, they're so just figuring out that model is, uh, is interesting, right? Uh, so this is your basic query here. This is pretty much the part you just always leave in there, which calls the label service, and you're off to the races there, literally, with horses. All right, so let's show you some other tricks of the trade here. So once you have your search coming back, and you're doing the autocomplete, depending on what's in the column, different things pop up as options, right? So if you have looked here, these different options here will light up depending on what type of data comes back in the columns. If there are geo coordinates available, map will automatically light up as an option. If there are dates in there, timeline will automatically light up as an option. Right? So I'll show you an example later where I bring back the entire bag of data for people or um, artists or authors, and you can use maps, you can use timelines, you can use uh, all different types of things. Once you have all these different columns, the options all light up for you. Okay, so uh, we will not do that since we did the example this morning. Okay, so I just showed you that. And let's go ahead and show you some of the more advanced tools. So now if we're going off and going beyond the Wikidata query, um, we actually have some cool tools, including Wikidata Graph Builder. Um, two of the tools that you probably should know about, Reasonator and Squid. How many people here have heard of Reasonator before? Maybe, okay, good, not too many. So Reasonator is a tool that tries to take what it finds in a Wikidata item and tries to turn what it sees into something more readable in your language, right? So if I go in here and show you Reasonator, I like how the creators call the Wikidata in pretty mode. And let's go ahead and just take a look at, um, we should have a woman in this list. Isn't that terrible? So we have no women in the list. Let's go to Nelson Mandela. So what it's gonna do is go to the Wikidata item and it's gonna go out and grab all the information and try to put it in some kind of readable form. It's not quite trying to mimic a Wikipedia article, but it's trying to make it a lot more readable than statement, 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 statement. So uh, it's taking a long time to process because it's probably a lot of How did you get to Reasonator at the link? Oh, go, um, go to, it's a good question, go to tools.wmflabs.org slash Reasonator. There's also a gadget in Wikidata you can turn on that puts a Reasonator link inside the Wikidata item. So I think I, I do have that now. So if I go to a Wikidata item, um, you can turn on, there, see that? So it adds a Reasonator link to every item. So if I go to a Wikidata item, you will see on the left-hand side uh, a link right there. So if I click on this, it'll go to the Reasonator item for John Singer Sargent, which will take a little bit of time to process. But here's the one for Nelson Mandela. So you can see, Sometimes it goes a little bit overboard because it has some repetition, it's got some things that you know, are described multiple times in multiple ways. So anyway, this is something that you can take a look at, but it tries to take all that information in kind of very utilitarian form and puts it in something nice and you can actually browse it in different languages there and that's kind of the beauty of Wikidata, right? It's semantic representation, it can translate every single label and Q number into something of your language. 
Okay, so it kind of looks like an info box that you might see on a Wikipedia article. I have no idea why it's re repeating everything so much here. That's kind of weird. Okay, but you can see it's trying to make it nice down there. Now another tool that's very similar. Should be a timeline or something at the bottom. Yeah, there's a good point. There's a timeline down here, which is kind of cool. All right, so he's got a lot of awards, you can imagine. So this is using um, the timeline.js, um, and it's just putting all that information down there. You also get kind of a gallery of images related to Nelson Mandela from Commons, and then also a QR code that you can snap to get there as well. All right, so it just tries to give you all the context for it that one item that it can grab from different sources. Now similar to that is Squid, which I like a little bit better because it actually does a deeper dive into the ontology. So if you go to uh, Squid, S-Q-I-D, it does take a little bit longer to look at stuff. So let's go ahead and look at um, Johann Sebastian Bach, for example. The thing to pay attention here is, to is that little blue line at the top, it's actually kind of a status bar as it loads things. So right now you may think this is not telling me much, but in fact, it's still churning in the background. You can see this little icon there spinning, 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 spinning. And when it comes up, you'll realize why it takes so long. It actually dives multiple levels down into Johann Sebastian Bach's kids and their relationships with other things and all kinds of stuff in the background. So let's wait for that to come back. Second, but you can see that's very similar to the Reasonator in design, but it does more in terms of diving into the ontology. All right, so let's wait. Well, we're not going to wait for that to come back. Let's let that process. How do you, I'm sorry? You can't, you can't, can you use, is there like a tool to have like a gadgets tab or how do you, how do you get to it? How do you get to the gadgets? Well, not the gadgets, but is Squid a gadget? Squid, it's, we, Squid is a standalone tool. Okay. So uh, okay. if you have, uh, here. So tools.wmflabs.org slash squid, right there, yeah. And if you go to my one page guide, it has a, a link to Squid here as well. So most tools for these things are tools.wmflabs.org slash whatever it is at the end. But how does that get automatically applied to your account, when you, to your pages? That's a good question. I don't think there's a gadget that adds okay, a squid so you have link. you to do it in the, that environment. Yeah, but that's a good question. I mean, if you can make a Reasonator gadget, it should be trivial to make a squid gadget, too. Yeah. Like a Reasonator comma squid gadget. Like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So the nice thing here is that not only do you see what's related to this state, I'm sorry, statements related to this item, you can actually go to related entities. Let's see if it came back. Okay, here we go. So if you click on from related entities, you will see a lot more deep diving into related entities there. Does everyone see that? So you can actually go down and look, and it actually puts descriptions and everything right next to it, right there. Oops. Statements related entities. So this is not a bad way to also discover relationships as well with other relatives, um, or if you're looking at some kind of um, classification, it'll show you subclasses and instances of that. We'll show you an example later on that I worked on with uh, Smithsonian. Okay, so Squid is really nice at showing these external linkages. Um, we t showed you Scolia very quickly this morning. Um, the nice thing about Scolia, it also incorporates like a timeline and kind of scores and a bubble graph showing, you know, what kind of terms show up. In, uh, in these pieces here. Wikidata Timeline is another one that might be useful for you to take a look at. So Wikidata Timeline allows you to kind of do a query and then shows you all the kind of start and stop dates on a timeline basis here. So there's some nice canned queries there about wars or empires or the span of uh, certain dynasties which are really useful to take a look at. So that's Wikidata Timeline. And then distributed game um, and the Wikidata game. So Rob showed you a little bit of that this morning. Um, we're not gonna go too deep into this, but just know that there are games that you can play that will allow you to match things in the database, right? Uh, so I can show you real quickly, since I don't know if Rob got to show you the distributed game. I think he showed you mix and match. But this is an example of what the distributed game does. You can only play this if you're logged in to Wikidata. Okay, so you cannot edit this as an anonymous person. But here, if you look at the distributed game, there's a whole bunch of different things uh, that you can try to help Wikidata with. Right? You can help look at duplicate items and maybe merge them in Wikidata. You can um, fill in the missing date of death or missing birthday. This is a game I made recently about depictions and pictures. 
Um, so let's go ahead and just click on the project merge one just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so here it says, I have found that there is already something called Ellen Gaura, Gaura, and here is one that is seems to be the same. It's got the similar kind of description. The geo coordinates are exactly the same, and these two editions or these two language groups are notorious for creating duplicate items in Wikidata. So I'm pretty confident this is the same topic. So I'm going to go here and say same topic, and then it's going to say, okay, thank you. I'm going to make that edit, merge them, keep going. And you're like, well, what did it just do? It did a lot of stuff in the background. So we're going to go back to Wikidata. And if I'm logged in under the same account, I can actually say, look, what did it do on my behalf? Let me look at my contributions. And you will see, hopefully, that what it did was it merged the item. So it made these two edits on my behalf by me just clicking that button. Right? So that's kind of cool. So these are what we call the game interfaces to Wikidata, which allows um, folks to be meaningful contributors, or at least to help out with the utility functions of Wikidata, simply by clicking. And the interface works really well as an, in addition on mobile. So I think I can simulate a mobile by doing this. Can I? Let's see if I can do it. If I make it narrow, will it do it? I think if I make it narrower. If I make it narrower, it's going to think I'm on a mobile, and then the buttons stick at the bottom, so I can actually just go in and say, same, different, different, same, 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 different, different, same, same. And you can make, like, 10 edits a minute or something like that, which is pretty cool. Right. So this is just one of many games that you can play. And the cool thing is you can make your own game. Like if you're like, hey, this is a pretty neat interface. Um, one of my projects is to see whether I can, you know, match things from this to something else. You can actually go in and look at the documentation and write your own game with the documentation here. So this is Magnus, who I talked about this morning is kind of our developer extraordinaire. And he basically said, yeah, here's the API. Write your game, plug it in, it'll be live. He doesn't even need to test it. It's just, I'll add it to the list. And that's basically what I did with the depiction game. And I just fed an AI output into that. And I had folks, three, 4,000 people play this game at this point, which is pretty cool. So that might be an interesting thing for you to play with if you know a bit of coding. So that is the distributed game, an interface for um, allowing the crowd to help by just clicking on confirming or denying certain recommendations. So if I write one of these games, how does it get approved? Here's the funny thing. It's in, in classic wiki fashion, it's just approved. <laughs> and unless you really make trouble, they won't disable it. It's kind of nice, right? <laughs> yeah, refreshing in this day and age. It's also really dangerous in many ways. But the, but the reason why it's not that dangerous is because even though I'm clicking on the buttons, I'm doing the edits on my myself, right? So I'm responsible for those edits. And if I start answering things wrong five, 10, 15 times, other people in the community will say, hey, Mike's not doing the right thing. And they'll leave a message for me to stop. Or if I'm really not stopping, they'll block me for like 24 hours and say, hey, cool down. Tell me why you're not doing the right thing on this game. So it's kind of you know classic wiki stuff. Like, Don't ask for permission, just do it. And until you screw up, keep doing it. Yeah, I was kind of surprised at first. I'm like, okay, I submitted my game and it showed up in the list right away. And that's pretty amazing. All right, so we have the game interface. Um, we have probably useful to a lot of you folks. How many people here have heard of quick statements before for Wikidata? Okay, only about a third of you, good. So quick statements is really the way to upload bulk content to Wikidata in a way that does not require coding. So the nice thing is you basically just upload triples through this tool called Quick Statements and you're off to the races. That's it. You just basically say Q something, comma, P something, comma, Q something. That's it, that's one triple. You stick it in the, in the field and you say, insert it into Wikidata and it does it. So if you know how to use spreadsheets, you can generate reams and reams of triples very quickly. So as long as you know how to deal with comma separated value or CSV files, you're, you're good. And even if you don't, it takes like five, 10 minutes to understand how it works. <laughs> So um, I'm guessing you would like to have references for everything that goes up there. Are you, is this just a way you get massive amounts of unreferenced <laughs> material? That's a good question. Um, right. If you are, this is ideal if you can also put in like an identifier pointing to where the statements you're inserting could verify those things. But you're right. This is not generally 
uh, referenced. Like most of these uploads are bulk uploads from a database, and hopefully you'll kind of point to the fact that it comes from this record on that URL. But you're right. Um, that's why a lot of the uploads through this process don't have references. Yes. Um, I was advised by someone recently that um, rather than using quick statements to go straight to using open reply as a direct sort of interface into the. Uh, yeah, that's possible. Do you too. have a preference or view on that? I, I have no opinion, so just ask. Me. Yeah, it really just depends on what your needs are. So this is the lowest uh, barrier, I think. Right, because as long as you can make a triple, even in a text editor, or just typing it on the, on the keyboard. OpenRefine, there is some kind of startup cost to learning OpenRefine. If you ever use the interface, it feels like it's from 1990s. It's kind of like hierarchical menus down like this, and people don't really do that anymore. Yeah. Um, but if you can harness the power of OpenRefine, it's a great tool. And you, you know, as Robert said this morning, you could do like thousands of edits very easily, but it does require some learning on how to do things their way. So I follow yeah, go ahead. Um, I, would, I would say the distinction, I mean, I, I agree with Andrew, it depends on your use case. The use case where you would use quick statements is if you have a bunch of tabular data that you are confident you want to put into Wikidata as is. Right. You don't have questions on whether the item already exists, right. whether the, the, you know, you, you just have data that you know you want to make the edits. It's literally just a batch editing tool. <laughs> right. OpenRefine is for when you have a data set some of which may have equivalent Wikidata entities, and some may not, and some may have slightly different spellings and may need some reconciliation. That's where OpenRefine shines, right? It's taking, it's taking your data set, beginning a kind of multi-iteration reconciliation process, uh, which it does intelligently. And then, you, and you can also use regular expressions and stuff to munch the data a little bit. Then you can decide, all right, so out of my 100 items, 70 already have Wikidata items. Right. For them, I want to add these statements, and it'll let you do that. B batch, you just define what you want to add, and it lets you do it. Then, I want to, out of the, I don't know, other 20, other 30 items, um, I want to contribute 25 items as new items, and I don't know, the five others are garbage data or something. <laughs> you know, So then you can create these new items, but it, it lets you kind of have this multi-iteration uh, uh, more nuanced handling of the data, and I think in, in real world instances, that is actually the more common tool for, for what institutions with data find themselves needing. Yeah, that's a good point. Honor, So the, the, the open refine is actually just sort of hooking into quick statements, or it's a separate uh, architecture? Separate. Okay, yeah. it just happens to mimic quick statements in some ways. Yeah, and it actually just added a feature of exporting a quick statement kind of batch yeah. If you prefer, for some reason, to use quick statements, you can do all the work in OpenRefine, and then when you're ready to make the edits, you can actually use quick statements to make the edits, if but, for some reason you prefer. And in neither case, you can add a reference. No, you can. You yeah. Can. Yeah, yeah, you can add references with both quick with statements both and with OpenRefine. Well. Yeah. You just yeah. have to state your reference that you're yeah. taking right. yeah. as right. part of the, each statement that you're adding. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a little more complex because you need to kind of like add more stuff at the end of your statement, but you can do it. And you can also do fully qualifiers and all that stuff, but yeah. it gets a little bit complex if you do like dates and things like that. There's very specific formats and needs, but it can be done. Right, you just have to know what they are. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then you have to escape the characters correctly and things like that. Yes. Don't discourage them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, quick statements is not intelligent. Okay. So it is just, you feed it and it's just gonna add. And so it'll add a duplicate statement if it's already there. No, no, the one exception is, if the statement exists exactly as you were adding it, it won't add it again. Right. Right, so if you are adding, I don't know, uh, uh, capital of the UK, London, that already exists, it won't add it again. But if you make even a slight difference or if your statement has a a qualifier or a reference or is in any other way not identical to what already exists, then it will add it. And it right. not intelligently say, oh, this is just a richer version of what we already know, we should somehow like merge it or something, you know, it won't do right. that. Right. And and also it doesn't ch I mean, it won't do any of this checking that open refine will do, right? In terms of like, let me look at this and see if it exists already with the same label mm -hmm. and description, all that stuff. It's not gonna do that. In that sense, it's, as Asaf said, if you're pretty sure you've done the research and say, this is a, a green field of Wikidata where there's nothing that exists at all for my data set, 
then you can kind of confidently use quick statements and just upload that uh, in one shot. But if you have some things that may exist, some things that need to be matched, an open refine is probably the way you want to go. Yeah. Another question. But in your example, you were, that was just adding the instance of U.S. Congressional Committee. I mean, you already had the few codes. Correct. So you're just, you were just adding, it's an instance of right. Congressional Committee. So you were adding two right. thirds of a triple. Right, and also quick statements can subtract statements too. Okay. So what might be, what I might have done before this, I'm not even sure, is get rid of certain statements and then now add these statements as the way that it should be modeled, right? So if you put a minus sign in front of the statement, it subtracts it. Yeah. And to, to be clear, he was not adding two thirds of a triple. He was, <laughs> he was adding the whole triple. Right. Okay, he wasn't creating a new item, he was adding a triple to an existing item, using the existing Q number of the existing item, and right. adding a new property with a new value. Right, but right. it's a whole triple that you're adding. Right. Right. So in this case, this duplicate should know because you have exact key number exactly, so it should know. Yeah, it will skip exact duplicates. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But as the soft said, if, if you put in like a new reference or something, it's going to be a duplicate, i.e., duplicate statement with a different qualifier underneath it. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to take a look at quick statements, um, this is the interface to it. You can say new batch. Uh, I'm not logged in. Oh, I so this is the interface that you just saw very quickly. If I'm logged in, it'll ask for you know, authentication using our system there. If I say new batch, then I just go ahead and paste that in there. I could even just type in a statement like this. I hope that's not true. Universe is not a cat, but if I wanted to, I could do that and ingest that, and it would add that statement to Q1. And then Android would get blocked. Yes, I'd be in very bad shape. <laughs> So you can use different uh, separators, you can use commas, you can use pipes, whatever you're used to, right? Yes? There, there's, there's actually a sandbox item right. that you can just beat away on yes. without worrying. Unfortunately, it's so long, I can't remember the number. <laughs> I wish it was like Q13 or something, but it's not. It's a really long number that I can never remember, yeah. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> quick statements. And you can either run it in the foreground or you can submit it as a batch that runs kind of in the background that you don't have to keep the web browser up for. Okay. Uh, so that's quick statements. Very easy to learn, um, an easy thing to try out. So this is the graph builder that I was talking to you about before. This does require a little bit of horsepower in a computer because it's going to give you a very dynamic graph to show you. Um, but it's a, it's a cool tool. So let me show you how it works. And this is a, under a weird URL. It's not really one of our WMF labs. Um, URLs there. So I go to angryloki.github. This is what it looks like. Let me go ahead and make this a bit smaller. So what it does is it takes a Wikidata item, you can kind of look up or down the hierarchy of whatever property you want. Right? So I can go in here and let's just go ahead and click on a example here. Class tree for human. Right? So I can actually, this is more fun than anything else, just drag a graph around <laughs> like that. And you can see Oops, let's try to get these labels clear so I can see them. Um, then, this is weird, having a Q number there without a label. We can take a look at that. So you can see human, person, individual, unit, unit, unit. So it's kind of like unit, and it kind of comes down here. Now this is what I'll often use to see if there's any problems, and this seems to be a problem right here. Why is there a naked Q number? It means there's no English language label for this. So I'll often just go ahead and click on this and inspect it and see what is this thing? Does anyone know? Sujeto. Legal subject. Legal subject. Huh. Yeah. Legal. Like, like legal person. Legal person. So it's yeah. said to be the same as, but for some reason, someone has inserted this as different than a legal person, as legal subject. There might be that distinction in their law. But if you look at legal person, here's what we have. That's the more popular one. And it has probably many, many articles. Yeah, see that. So you can see here that we do have this property set, set to be the same as, because some people might possibly trying to merge these things, but this is a way to tell the community, no, 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 this should be a separate thing, even you know, if you have to look into it and figure out why. So there's no English language label, but for some reason, Spanish, Polish, Romanian, Slovak have decided this is a, a, an item on its own, which is interesting to see that in this graph builder. So that's kind of a good example of how you probably wouldn't discover this in any other way other than kind of seeing the class hierarchy. So if I go in here, let's say, um, painting, oops, 
surface covered particularly with paint. I can kind of see how that's derived, right? A painting is a type of visual artwork. So that's going kind of up. If I go down, I can say, instead of forward, I can say reverse, and I hit build, and whoa, a lot more comes back, right? So you can see that we have paintings, a mural is a type of painting, a Buddhist painting, and then you know different subclasses. This doesn't look that clean to me, but it's not a bad starting point. Does everyone see that? Is that if you if you want to, you can go both directions, kind of shows you up and down, but you'd better put some kind of cap on it. Otherwise, it could just keep growing and growing. Many times I'll tell folks just to put some cap on the iterations. But this is a nice way to kind of inspect the class tree and then start to identify some objects that probably need labels in your language. So I'll, I'll sometimes work for 40, 50 minutes, an hour, on just fixing these labels on certain class trees just because these should probably all have English language labels here. Okay, so sometimes I need to do some Google Translate and some investigation into what they call these in English. Or sometimes you don't translate and just use the, the native language label. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So it's a little bit tough to make out sometimes. You may have to reconfigure some things or to move things around to figure out what's going on there. Okay, so this is a way to visualize class trees in a way that I don't think any other tool does as well. So that is the Wikidata Graph Builder. But does that tool only show the English version of Wikidata? Oh, no, it's a good question. So I can choose whatever language I want there. Okay. Um, so that's a good question. Let me go ahead and go back and show you that. So if I go in and say painting, and then I say uh, subclass of, right? So you can tra traverse any property you want. It could be occupation, it could be uh, subclass of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. So you can, you can do all kinds of different properties here. But I can go ahead and choose like Chinese, and there it goes. It's all in Chinese there. And I go reverse. I don't know. It doesn't translate the mode though for some reason. So that's exactly what I saw before, but the labels are all in Chinese now. Yeah. So this is a really useful thing that we've actually done some Wikidata meetups where all we do is bring up the class tree and then just go ahead and add, fill in all the labels for a particular language. And that's really useful. That's a very useful thing to have to make sure all the labels are filled in. Okay, any other questions about this? So this is a nice way, and you can just keep this up here. And each time you click on, an, on a node, it brings up the uh, link in a new window. Okay, Tabernacle. So I'm a big fan of this tool. This is basically, what if you could take the output of Wikidata query and live edit the table of stuff that comes back? That's basically what Tabernacle does. Okay, so um, let me show you an example of that live. So let's go into query.wikidata.org and let's go in and find an example of, um, let's not do goats, it's not too many goats. Okay, let's do horses. Okay, so this is showing us all the horses. 9,500 results. And the cool thing about this, and you probably know from Sparkle, if you want to find out the information, but it's okay if it comes back blank, you put the optional part in front. So that's why when we come back, there's some holes in the grid, right? So we have birth year, death year, we might know the mother, we might not know the mother, we might have the information, but wouldn't it be nice if I clicked on this and just typed in like a spreadsheet and it just updated Wikidata? That's what Tabernacle does. So once you have your Sparkle query, you can just go ahead and grab the entire Sparkle query like that, go to Tabernacle, and just paste in that Sparkle query in this box right here. Okay, so you go ahead and paste it in. You can also manually enter a list of a few items if you want, but you know, probably better is to use a Sparkle query. And you hit run. Okay, it's done that Sparkle query, hopefully in the background, and you can now go ahead and add columns. Let me see the labels um, in English. And let me see the description in English and hit run. Okay, and that's basically what we're seeing here, right? Horse label description right there. Um, we can actually say birth year, death year, father, right? So let's go ahead and put in the 569, which is birth date and death date, 569, 570. So I can go back in here and say show table settings. I can add a new P569 and look at that. It just brings it right back right there. And I can add another column, P570, boom, hit run, 
and here I am with death, date, birth date, all here. Now the cool thing is I can just go ahead and double click on that and edit live. Okay, so I can go in here and let me see if there's anything. So look at here, this is a missing thing, even the highlight things in red where it's asking for you to contribute something. Is there anything I can fix here? I don't know if there is. Oh, here's one without a label or a description there. Let's just go ahead and do this. Probably the right thing, I'm not sure. But I'm gonna go ahead and double click here, paste it in there, hit return. It's making the edit on my behalf, that's it. Just to double check, I always like to double check, go back to my wiki data, hit my contributions, and you will see that that edit has been made on my behalf through ta Tabernacle. So this is a really powerful tool that even not a lot of wiki data folks really know about, that you can take the output of Sparkle and then decide which columns you wanna edit and go ahead and make those changes. And you can actually double click here, add a date. You can even drag and drop, I hesitate to do this, but they can drag and drop this date onto this box and it'll copy that <coughs> statement over there, which is kind of cool. Okay. So this is a, this is a classic uh, tool for the use case of you have rich data about a certain thing that you can express via a query, you can sit people who know nothing about link data, wiki data, Sparkle, anything like that, sit them in front of this and just have them enrich the data according to your data set or your reference materials about, I don't know, people buried in the cemetery or something, right? If you're there, you have access to the death dates, etc. you can just fill it in like a spreadsheet. It's a really useful tool for yeah. that kind of event. Right, right, it's really powerful. And it, the great thing is you can have people fill it out in different languages, right? You can choose whatever language you wanna work with. Uh, I don't know if there's more than this, but that's what they have right now. And uh, we actually have had those edathons where we had the source material and the person working in front of Tabernacle, they didn't know what, um, how to operate a Wikidata query, but they were able to work with Wikidata in a meaningful way. Right, so I take a look at Wik Tabernacle. It is a tool that <clears throat> has been around for a while, but then it just got a revamp recently. It's much more powerful now to do these things. Um, oh, I won't show you this. We're running a little bit short on time here, but there actually is a whole um, uh, case study we did. Why don't I'll show you real quick. A case study we did where, you remember the museum that burned down in Brazil, which is a huge tragedy because they did not have a great cataloging system at the, at the museum. So in fact, our Wikimedia community down in Brazil has been helping them with asking folks to upload pictures, and they've been trying to do some of the inventorying online in Wikidata. And this has been really useful to have Tabernacle here. So that even people who don't understand Portuguese can help at least with the classifications and the departments and things, because I can read the classification departments in English and move the objects around in Tabernacle and they show up with Portuguese labels for our collaborators in Brazil. So that's pretty, pretty cool. So um, this is a great example of how Tabernacle, this is kind of two different views on the same database. see. So yeah, here's a good example of a query where we're going to try to bring back all these columns in Wikidata Query to show you the power of the Wikidata Query interface. So this is a query that is part of the examples, which is show me all the, the most cited books authored by women in Wikidata. So it's not the most complete data set in there, but it's interesting. So this is showing you the results as a bubble chart. Now if I go back to the raw view here and hit the query again, you know, you'll see that if there is a kind of a scalar value in this column, it can actually produce a bubble chart just based on, on that. Right? That's what we see here. So we use this a lot for glam institutions to show you who are the top artists or who are the top um, authors in a certain category. Um, but if you go back and do some more columns uh, in the Wikidata query, some cool things start coming back. Right? So this is an example of you can actually take that same query, bring it to Tabernacle, and edit the missing information in Tabernacle. But here's the query where if we have a date of birth, we want to return it, which is right here. If we have a place of birth, we want to return it. If there's an image, we want to bring that back as well. Right? So these are the optional clauses that we have here in the Sparkle query. And if we do that, these are the options that we get, which are pretty cool. So if we get a kind of a tabular data that comes back, which has the author, the label, the coordinates of where they were born, um, the timeline, all these different things, you actually have the option of showing the map display, the image gallery, the metrics here, or a timeline here. So what was really interesting is that most of these are modern day authors, but you actually had you know, two women authors way back, you know, back in the 1200s, 
1100s, is that correct? So quite far back in, in history there. So this is a good example of the query that brings back multiple columns, and you can use any kind of display methods for those. <coughs> Okay, and if you're looking for something simpler, so here's a tool called VizQuery. So this is much simpler in that you can actually go in there and use pull-down menus, and actually, when you're typing into the blanks, it's almost like Mad Libs, you're typing in there, it'll start to fill in things that match there, right? So this is easier if you're kind of intimidated by uh, the full Wikidata query. And the nice thing is that once you do the simple query, you can always take that simple query and then bring it into the full Wikidata query to do that. So this is what it looks like here. You can actually say, you know, um, instance of. So this is kind of like what happens when you hit control space in Gadata query without having to hit that. House kept. Okay, so by default, it tries to bring back something that's visually nice. You can download it as a CSV file, or you can bring that into the full Sparkle uh, Wikidata query. So this might be a good starting point for some of you just doing Sparkle. Okay, so we talked about those. Um, let me show you some examples here of maintenance queries. Uh, so we'll show you this real quick and then we'll take a quick break because we're here for two hours, so it might be a little bit long. So some of you had asked about how do I locate inconsistencies or consistencies in the data set and how do I figure out how an object fits into the existing model there? So I think the first thing you want to take a look at when you're looking for a starting point is see if there's a wiki project related to what you're interested in. Right? So the ones that are pretty well modeled in our community are like astronomy, telescopes, visual arts. Probably the most prolific project that we have is some of all paintings. So this is a very dedicated crew of folks who either do this professionally or amateur or as on the side of trying to catalog every single significant painting in the world um, by taking in the linked data uh, from different GLAM institutions. Um, cultural heritage, pretty good. And just even looking at well-formed, like showcase items in Wikidata is a good example. So one of the best ones here is Wiki Project Visual Arts. So the, if you go to Wiki Project Visual Arts, they even have a whole table that shows you here's how we model you know, sculpture, here's how we model paintings, here's how we model uh, pottery. So this is all the different types of uh, uh, properties that they think that we should be setting for these types of things. So if you go through, you'll see, you know, different descriptions here. So for example, they say, if you're trying to do a painting, this is kind of how we model it. If you're trying to do an illumination, here's how we model it here. All right, so take a look at some of these projects. If you're interested in kind of formally documenting a certain aspect of what you want to be doing, you might want to take a look at these as templates for how to do that. Um, and then reporting tools. So the other thing is Listeria. Listeria is a very useful tool that basically runs a Sparkle query against Wikidata and then plops the output onto a wiki page, typically in Wikipedia. Um, so this is really great for projects that um, want to take a look at large swaths of um, articles to see how well they're doing, and one of the most prominent ones that we have that are uses with Steria is called Women in Red. How many people here have heard of Women in Red? Okay, not too many. So this is a project that tries to, you know, get better gender equity in Wikipedia. Right now, only about 17 to 18 percent of all biographies in Wikipedia are about women, um, and that is something that the project is trying to rebalance somewhat by looking at Wikidata content, finding out prominent women that probably should have an article and then highlighting them and prodding folks to contribute to those. So this re regular reporting of lists by looking at Wikidata and saying, hey, this person has all these awards and got this, uh, you know, this many citations and publications. If this person were a man, definitely would have an article. This is a great argument for her having an article in Wikipedia, right? So Listeria is used to create these work lists in ways that provide easy one-click um, editing of those types of articles. So um, this is what it looks like. It is basically like a Sparkle query inside of a template on Wikipedia or any wiki that we run. It can be on Wikidata itself, it could be Wikimedia Commons, it could be Wikipedia. And then what it does, it says, when you take that Sparkle output, here's kind of the parameters I want you to show in these columns. And the result of that is pretty cool, 
it gives you stuff like this. Like it kind of gives you the picture, all this relevant information, and then this red link that says, please click on this red link and you can start to edit the article about this woman and we've tried to serve you all the information on the platter that you can use to get there. So we'll take a quick break and then if we come back, I'll show you some of the particulars of how Women in Red uses these lists and how it might be useful for you if you're trying to do the same thing where you might have a body of content that um, you want to prod folks to improve, whether it's on Wikipedia or Wikidata itself. Okay, so why don't we uh, take a break till, right now it's 155, so 10 minutes, does that sound good? 205, come back, and then we'll keep going from there. <laughs> now you can keep it going. I want to tell you. Okay. I mean, when you step over here, you're out of your picture. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> as long as the audio is there. Yeah. See, you, you have that second computer. When you were at right. that, you were okay. Okay, I'll mind. try to stay to the right. I didn't mind interrupting. Yeah. I wanted to tell you at the break. Okay, great. I put my drink somewhere, but I don't know where it is. That's it. I think I'll just take this. Yeah, that was yours. <laughs> no, there was a cup with ice in it. I can't oh, remember. Oh, there was. There's one over there. Is it? That might be it. Actually. That might be, because okay. nobody's sitting there. Thank you. So that is, let me think, what is it going to be if you're looking at? Yeah. So it's looking yeah, at different things. Well, schema.org has this. We're building it because we weren't already invested in the space. Then you can also do the image service. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah, we have all the data in my program, so I can take a look at the FR.WP, or, yeah, it's just a scheme of all about. And then accept lots of these statements that point to this. So, um, so yeah, basically trying to match whether we have uh, an article in a certain language for a topic and looking at it is just basically parsing this probably what the prefix is here. Which is kind of disappointing, but it's kind of that's why we do it. We even hard code like HTTPS colon double slash the bar. It's that's how they decide to do it. This is how they do it. And the uh the rich Show me an example. I mean, what yeah, like, I don't know, whatever. Um, any, any person. Do the cat, does it work on the cat's phone? That's no, I mean, the actual, like, display device. Oh, do you mean the, the record? Yeah. Um, let's take a look at this. So this is, this is just stored as a string. Then what happens is this is basically pasting this string into a formatter URL. Okay. So if you go to this thing here, to the, the property, you'll see yeah, I was just curious how it here. And that's going to oh, basically okay. place it in here okay. using substitution. Yeah. That's, okay, thank you. Yeah, so that's all it really does is, uh, right, this is not an object, it's just yeah. a shortcut to the direct buy app link. And then the other thing is, and do you continue to the meeting about should be adding those links back to the server position? The foundation doesn't do any editing. Or sorry, the foundation doesn't do any editing. No, it's weird. I mean, you basically just have them. Yeah. So that's the first one. So those are all like the following years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's volunteers, but at some point we should make sure there's a methodical way to keep them updated. So there, there is a proposal they're working with now called Signed Statements that tries to make sure that, that um, these things are fresh and up to date and that you actually have some kind of like um, yeah, if validation you know, like, that you can download the entire library of national authority. Right, right. You have all the IDs. So we could go through and then like try and match it. Yeah, you'd be surprised that there's a lot of people doing that. Yeah. Um, okay. That there's there's some folks who focus on BIAF, there's some folks who focus on Stack or other identifiers. It's, it's the ones that are not like the, the most popular that are not as well maintained. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure.
<laughs> That's the kind of review I needed. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we get started again? And I thought a, a nice way to get back into things is something that Sop suggested, which is great, which is uh, the mix and match tool that we might have talked about before. So this mix and match tool, if you want to try it, you can do it if you have an account that you created a while back. If you just create an account on the Wikimedia servers, we um, like to see, I don't want to say we isn't me, but the community of folks who set the policy like to see a new user make a bunch of edits and exists for a few days before automated editing is enabled for their account. So unfortunately, if you just create your account, you won't be able to play this right now. But if you do some edits and wait a few days, you can. So the mix and match tool, as we mentioned before, is basically a way to take an existing database and kind of line it up against Wikidata, and then use a very simple kind of heuristic algorithm to say, I think this in your database is this in Wikidata, and we just need a human to either confirm or deny that match. Right? Sometimes they're really nice matches, sometimes they're not great matches, just depending on you know the data set coming in and how much metadata we can we can uh, pull from to match against Wikidata. So one that's kind of funny, and this is always a problem that we have, is um, if we go look at the catalogs here, this is kind of reverse chronological. So one of the newest ones is Whitney Museum of American Art artwork. So this is this is going to be a list of all these artworks from the Whitney Museum, and it's like oh that's pretty cool. These are pretty, some famous artworks, and we have famous artworks in Wikidata. Let's try to match them up. Now, it's one thing if you're matching up like, you know, Renaissance paintings and things like that. Here's the problem with like postmodern artwork. It is that. <laughs> it's untitled. Is untitled untitled or is it untitled? Or is it the same as untitled? So you might have an artist with like 50 works just called untitled with no other information other than that. So it's almost like a useless exercise that comes to <laughs> this type of art work for the Whitney and Wikidata, there's a lot more work that needs to be done by visual inspection or other type of um, metadata. But this is kind of interesting just to see that this, in this particular case, mix and match is probably not a great match. 
because it's just not enough information to make a you know, distinct match there. But what does make sense is something like Library of Congress. So this has been around for a while. Um, this the, the source for graphic materials. So there are some things that have been matched already, there's some things that are unmatched. And these that we have here call automatically matched. So this is basically an algorithm that said, I think these are the same. Could you help verify this for me? And if you take a look at some of this, if I click on automatically match, it's going to give me a list. I can also run this in game mode where it presents one item, another item, another item, or I can just browse this whole list. And I can basically come down here and say confirm or remove this suggestion. All right, so this I can do very fast. And you'll notice that sometimes there's enough information, sometimes there's not. So the, the green item here is from the thesaurus for graphic materials database. The blue item with the Q number obviously is the Wikidata item, and then whatever description is there. And it's just trying to line these up and say, are these a match? Now sometimes you will see that it's close, but are they exactly the same? Is cycle racing the exact same as bicycle racing? I might spend some more time to dive into our items to see whether we have something that's exactly bicycle racing. These are probably the same, but I'm not confident enough to make that choice. If you go down here, this looks like it's a match, but wait, this is probably a scientific journal called Preventive Medicine. It's not the same as the concept Preventive Medicine, right? So I do not want that. In fact, I can say remove that, that's a bad match, and that helps the whole enterprise here, right? Say, don't put that up as a candidate, it's a bad match. So I did find a decent match, I think, on the next page here. So if I go down here, remember this is a thesaurus for graphic material, so it's a thesaurus for describing things or nouns and artworks. So I can see here, French doors, casement doors, windows, and then we have French window, well, I don't know, is that the same? Probably, but probably, I'm not sure. So let's keep looking down here. Um, we're gonna go down here, puddles and the video game, I'm not sure that's the same either. Let's go to the next page. And it, you can see there's a little bit of delay here. So sometimes it's gonna be matching proper nouns, like movie titles, against a concept or a, a, um, an item there, and that's not what we want. But let's see if we can find a match. Does anyone see a match as we scroll down here? This is a painting, that's not the same. Conformation show is not exactly the same as a dog show. There, let me make this bigger so you can see. Maybe the labor supply. What was it? Labor supply. Sorry, even British study. Oh, that's probably why. Let's see. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Well, cannot auto describe. So, cannot auto describe. We can inspect it and see. So, I'm bringing up another tab. Labor supply. Labor supply. It seems like it's the yeah, right that's thing. The concept. Right. So, I would say that's the right concept. And what I can do in the, in the process is help <coughs> fill in the description, right? If I had a real description, I wouldn't have had to click out. So what I can do is go to the Wikipedia article. And I can go here and say, there's a total hours that workers wish to work. Let's just copy that. Oops. Bring that back to Wikidata. Let me get rid of that little. Let's just put that in there. So I fixed this along the way. I don't have to do that, but I'm being nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit confirm, and that has matched those two things. Does that make sense to everyone? And what happens now, if I go in and hit my contributions here, you will see that it's actually made an edit to the labor supply item. And what it's done is it added a new claim or statement saying Q2717283, predicate P5160, and then it added this identifier out there. So just to confirm, TGM, that's what it added. Just by clicking that button, confirm. Yes? What's the difference between a claim and a statement? Uh, interchangeable, would you say, Asaf? Yeah, there's a, there's a technical difference in the implementation. They're basically used interchangeable. Yeah, we pretty much say they're the same. Yeah. So does that make sense to everyone? So that interface says, so, so Mix and match specifically is to connect to external databases, and that's why it shows up under the identifiers part here. The, the distributed game, as the API writer, or as the game writer, you can do whatever you want. You can add two or three statements to Wikidata, you can do all kinds of different things. But for mix and match specifically, you don't have to write any code, you just feed the catalog in. The heuristics 
you know, try to match it up, and then it spits out this list of possible matches, and then the crowd comes and helps. So if you want to ever see what the stats look like, you can actually go in there and take a look. Um, look at the Royal Society or something. That has a nice... Go see her. Fellows of the Royal Society. FRS. Yeah. Where is it? Right there. Here FRS. we go. Yeah. So you can take a look at the stats here. Oh, 100%. And then it shows you even matches over time, and then who were the ones who matched the most. So there's a scoreboard, a leaderboard there too. All right. So this is interesting in that you don't really find this dynamic in Wikipedia, but Wikidata, the games have a major role to play for uh, our matching things together. Okay, so I encourage you to try it, and it's one of those things where you'll often find Wikidata volunteers sometimes will deep dive into certain things, but then sometimes just casually they'll play the game, like that's my 30 minutes of contribution today for Perfect for commutes. <laughs> yes. So my list commutes are standing in line waiting for something. You can do a lot of this with your thumb on your mobile phone. Not yes. Car. <laughs> not the car, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is slightly off topic, I suppose, but I, I wonder: uh, are people building offline tools so you can't build this? So they're useful for sort of field work and conference. Offline tools. I don't. I'm not aware of any. Not so much. No. Yeah, I'm yeah. imagining somebody collecting uh, facts somewhere and then wanting to batch up. But I mean, obviously, they could use open file. Right. Uh, I just wondered if anyone's looked at that problem. Not so far. But it, it might be interesting if, if the kind of people who do field work were interested in kind of immediately reconciling against things. Like, I have a thing. Do we know about it in Wikidata yet or not? And they want an offline Wikidata to compare against. That absolutely can be done. Kind of the opposite of your question, there's a cool tool if you ever want to try it called Picture This, and this is using your mobile phone, you can actually, with one click on your phone, take a picture of something, upload it to Wikimedia Commons, and interlink it to Wikidata in one shot, which is really powerful. So I've done this like about five, ten times just in the one day yesterday. I was walking around this neighborhood. I said, oh, there's no picture of this building. And I just went ahead, and this is showing you on this screen, but if you run on your mobile, it's going to use your geolocation. So if I click on this, it's going to use your location. Hey, there's no Boston Latin. That's actually right out the window there. I should have took, taken one before. Yeah. But if you're on your mobile, believe it or not, you click on this thing here, and then it brings up your mobile interface saying, do you want to take a picture or use something from your stored pictures? You hit, you know, use my camera, you take the picture, and then it uploads it to Commons under Creative Commons uh, attribution license. Then it sideloads it into Wikidata by adding it as an image in Wikidata. And that's like the most powerful thing I've ever seen in our movement of one click upload and cross linking. Because it's always been the pain to upload content, visual content. And this is not only does that, but it interlinks it to Wikidata at the same time. So uh, I even had my eight year olds do this. Um, when I had the take your kid to work day, I decided to say, well, let's live a day in the life of a Wikimedian. So we walked around DC near the White House and there was no pictures of the presidential townhouse. They had pictures of all these other things. And I got my eight-year-old to go there, take a picture, and upload it to Wikidata. And that's pretty cool that eight-year-olds really can't edit Wikidata, uh, Wikipedia, but they can meaningfully contribute to other projects. So I encourage you to try that, to, to take a look at the, uh, the picture of this tool for Wikidata. Just another example of you know, all the cool things you can do outside of Wikipedia space. Yes, go for it. Right. That's a great question. I mean, how do you do quality checking on images added to Wikidata? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised at how many folks have weird kind of maintenance queries and work lists behind the scenes that you're not even aware of, but but sometimes you do something and like about a, a day later someone puts a message on your talk page saying, hey, I noticed you did this because I have a query that monitors <laughs> weird things that you never knew they're doing. So well, for example, this tool is prompting you to take a picture of the Latin school out the window. Mm -hmm. It does this based on your coordinates and the known coordinates of the Latin school. If 
if you instead upload a photo you took yesterday in Toronto, the coordinates won't match, right. and an automated process could find you know, any photo that claims to be of coordinates X and is more than whatever, right. five miles away, is probably not a photo of that thing. Right. That's an easy, trivial, automated way to find at least the worst offender. <laughs> uh, and and our, our community gets quite creative at, at finding even more sophisticated ways. The thing about libraries, we're more likely to be uploading a photo from our special collections. Right. We're right. not going to have any geo coordinates. That's true. Right. That's true. Right. But that's where um, we are talking earlier about AI and the kinds of things that are coming into play now. And that that is something for this year, the foundation is going to help support a lot more in terms of AI and vision research. Just to whet the appetite, we could easily imagine a tool that searches for non-free, like Google image search for Boston Latin School, right? And AI compares them to this new ostensibly, uh, ostensible photo that you contributed. And if it matches in some AI sense, then we accept it as a freely licensed photo. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yes. Oh, it has to be like a pixel something, otherwise the picture makes it super blur. Oh yeah. Really we, we have some really bad quality pictures, yeah. but it's usually in the, in the absence of anything that's free, that's better, we'll kind of take kind of a cruddy, super cropped, blurry photo um, if there's no free version. Yeah, sometimes it's just like a video grab and a crop, and it's not very good. It's the only thing we have. So that, that is kind of the knock on Wikipedia, and it's a legitimate knock. But it's like if we are the sum of all human knowledge, we're not really because we're the sum of all knowledge that's free, been freely released and licensed. And we're always going to be behind in the visual domain because at least with text, you can resummarize text for images. You just it has to be free or not free, and we just don't have that capability to match Getty images or the the big photo archives out there. Yeah. So, so in this use case, if you put a photograph that goes into WikiMedia mm -hmm. and then is linked to a corresponding somebody else uploads another photograph of the same thing, is there some process for deciding which of those photographs will be displayed? Uh, or is it yeah, last it's, it's last usually the then? same edit wars that occur over any kind of content. So it's a human decision? Yes, yes, usually it is. I, you know, we do have some parameters, like we prefer higher resolution, we prefer something that is um, more true to the story. So one great example all the time is um, Breaking news. So Wikipedia is really good, for better or for worse, covering disasters and crises. So whether it's um, explosions, terrorist attacks, the burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral, that was one where every hour there's a different photo coming in. People were saying, is this one better than that one? And the picture kept changing to update based on that. Yeah. So the same wiki processes for figuring out what text is better. Also, the images always get flipped around for breaking news stories. All right, so let me show you some examples of women in red, just in case it's useful to you folks out there, because this is probably the most active user of Listeria. And the great thing about this is it kind of runs in the background, so it's not like you need to wait for a query to come back. You just kind of save the Sparkle query in a template, and it just kind of runs every 24 hours, you know, through a, a cron job. And this is a great example of how they're making multiple work lists here, saying here are women that need to be uh, written about by occupation, by birth year, by region. They give you every different way of looking at the uh, set of women that should be written about. So Women in Red is really good about this. I'll show you the live page here. All right, so you can kind of browse it by any number of these different types of um, criteria. And once you click in, all these subpages and everything are all, not all of them, but most of these are generated by um, Listeria which are basically doing Wikidata queries. Right? So here's a good example of one here. So these are missing articles by nationality, Mali. Right? And basically it says, here's all the information we have about them, here's the Wikidata item, and then you click on this, it'll get you into the create an article interface. Right? All right, so that's why we call women in red. The, you know, red links on Wikipedia designate a missing article, and it's trying to get you to click on them to help create those articles. Okay, so anything with the WD there has been generated by Listeria. 
If you want to take a look at it, the nice thing is that this is all very transparent. If you go in here, you can actually go ahead and edit the page, um, edit source, and you can actually see the invocation right there. See that? So you yourself can take this code right here, plop it on your own page or subpage and make your own work lists this way. It's kind of cool. There's not, not that many projects out there that say, hey, yeah, bang our database as much as you want and make as many lists as you want. Wikipedia does, so that's what you can do here. All right, and then you can actually go out and bring that query into Wikidata query if you want as well. All right, so I showed you that. All right, so we'll skip the, some of all paintings we just showed you that before. Um, but if you want to take a look at that more, you can take a look at that. So I'll just show you one case study that we did with um, military history, and it's a pretty good illustration of what you can do with the, all these tools that we talked about with um, the Wikidata Graph Builder, with Squid. So I think Squid is not a bad starting place for any type of domain that you're talking about. So the, the problem we had in front of us was, what do all the, um, they call firearms cartridges look like in Wikidata? Okay, so again, the cartridge is basically the bullet plus the casing and the gunpowder inside. So you probably, even if you don't know much about guns, there's a huge family of rifle cartridges, handgun cartridges, uh, shotgun cartridges, and someone or many people over time have added these in different bursts in Wikidata, but they weren't really well modeled or done in one shot that is really um, well thought out. So by just by looking at this initial query with squid, this thing kind of jumps out at you. Right here. <coughs> Right? So if you do the squid query, it says direct instances. That means instance of a cartridge. And immediately you see that this relationship is wrong. In Wikidata, we like to say that if there's a something, and this is a kind of something, it's a subclass of it. If it's a real physical one-time thing of it, it's an instance, right? Basic modeling. Here, either someone or many someones said, this type of cartridge, you know, a German cartridge, a Russian cartridge, is an instance of a cartridge. This is the most common mistake we see in modeling on Wikidata. It's not, it's a subclass, right? The bullet that was actually, and this is true, there was a bullet in the medical museum in Maryland was the bullet that, was, that killed Lincoln and was extracted from his skull and is under glass now. That's an instance of a bullet. There shouldn't be many instances of bullets in Wikidata. There should be many subclasses of bullets because there's different types of cartridges and things like that. So by looking at this right away, you're looking at, oh, no, that's wrong. There shouldn't be 320 direct instances of that type. Those are types of cartridges. They should be subclasses. Um, so the first thing we did when we were excavating this is to say, you know, we should move these instances into subclasses. In fact, subclasses of subclasses. So cartridge is basically, you know, your casing, gunpowder, and then your bullet. But then we also have rifle cartridges. So we have revolver, cannon, shotgun, pistol, all these different things. So these all are subclasses of cartridge, and then you have though other things are subclasses of those, right? So not only should these not be instances of cartridges, they shouldn't even be subclasses of cartridges, they should be subclasses of a subclass of cartridge down here. Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense. So cartridges here, whoa, <laughs> nothing, I got nothing. There we go. So cartridges here, and right now we had the, the wrong thing that said that let's say a nine millimeter cartridge, like you put in a handgun, was an instance of that. I said, no, it shouldn't be that way, but it shouldn't even be a subclass of it. We want the subclass of a cartridge to be a pistol cartridge, right? And then we want a nine millimeter cartridge to be a subclass off of that. And then let's say there's a very, very famous cartridge that killed someone very famous, then you might have an instance of a nine millimeter bullet, we might want to call it the nine meter bullet that killed Hitler or something like that, right? So you have something under glass that is an instance of a bullet. But in general, it should be cartridge, pistol cartridge, and then the nine millimeter cartridge, which is a very popular cartridge for handguns, should be a subclass like that. So we, that's why we're trying to move all these things down the hierarchy into proper modeling. So how do we do that? We want to get basically, and we had a bunch of folks where you can see this, where they just weren't sure. Like, I'm not sure if it's a subclass or an instance, so I'm adding both. You'll see this quite often in Wikidata as well, which is not good. So even just the cleanup of this um, was 
uh, took a long time just to go in and remove all the instances and then you go in and add all the subclasses. Does that make sense? So just excavating stuff was really um, interesting here. So quick statements was really useful in this area. You just subtract instance of, and I believe, Asaf, correct me if I'm wrong, if you try to subtract a statement that doesn't exist, it's a no op. It's just fine. It doesn't error out. It just yeah. does nothing. Yes? So, as I'm sure all of us in the room know, people can argue about taxonomies for years on end. Yes. Um, <laughs> does this mean that you get taxonomy wars in the way that you get sort of edit disputes? So do people go in and change those taxonomies periodically, or how does this work? Fortunately, in my experience, Wikidata is a much more deliberative and friendly place for now than Wikipedia, which is a bit more, at this point, passive aggressive and just bashing each other over the head. Um, so we tend to talk things out more and we all kind of feel like we're on the same boat, like we need to figure this out together. Um, but you still, you, you have clashes, there's no doubt. I don't think it's as violent as I've seen in other parts of the movement. What do you think, Yeah, I, I would say at this point, there's, there's actually a thirst for more <laughs> engagement on taxonomy, right. relatively few people on Wikidata actually engaging with this sort of thing, with let's figure out the precise ontology of uh, ammunition. You know, <laughs> there's very few people who would actually step up to do that and to clean it up and to you know, figure it all out. So actually, when, when such people do step up, they usually want thought partners, they want someone to help them uh, with the edge cases, help challenge their ideas. Uh, most of them are not professional ontologists, most of them don't have access to the collections most of you have access to, uh, uh, including all the experience of you've already seen all the edge cases, you've already <laughs> modeled, you know. So uh, we're amateurs, we're passionate amateurs, and we're happy to work together on these things. Uh, I would say we don't have wars over that. I mean, for what it's worth, this is just a, an impression. So, so I'll, I'll just give you a very brief uh, context for my question. Mm -hmm. So I've been contracted by an organization in Japan to uh, help them develop vocabularies. But they're very interested cautiously, as they get sort of familiar with Wikibase, mm -hmm. to have a, a crowdsourced aspect to the vocabularies that they're using. And this is to describe a particular scientific domain. And all of our discussions, and, and this is partly my fault as well, but all of our discussions have been predicated on the idea that you would either have a controlled taxonomy of terms on the one hand, or you would use something like Wikidata on the other. And the idea that you might actually use Wikidata to model never come into that discussion. I just offer that to you as a, you know, a, 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 a recent experience from a lot of people, quite a large group of people who've been looking at this for some time. Right. So this yeah. has been a revelation for me. So oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to keep talking about, you know, I, as Asaf said, the funny thing is, <laughs> yeah, you don't run into too many clashes because it's, it's kind of an empty space right now. So, yeah. For librarians, I mean, taxonomy on the fly, ontology on the fly, <laughs> antithetical to everything we've ever done. In our life, right? I mean, let's be blunt. Right? So, I mean, it, it, does the community ever say, let's let's put the cart back behind the horse, let's figure out what kind of taxonomy we want to use, let's not have this yes no stuff all over the place, let's, you know, let's it, it does actually, twice and cut lines. It, it does actually. So, uh, intuitively, uh, Wikidata volunteers understood once they started modeling some books and, and bibliographic items on Wikidata, they quickly realized, oh wait, this is this is complicated. <laughs> uh, which of course we librarians have known for a while, right? Um, but uh, because of that, they set up one of those Wikidata task forces uh, to figure this out. And sooner or later, one of the people joining the task force was. I think the librarians have thought about this long and hard. Maybe we can learn something <laughs> from them. And then they, they brought in a lot of the you know, existing uh, uh, wisdom of uh, the library science profession. And um, they realized, oh, this is so much more complicated than we thought that we should hold our horses and not, for example, mass ingest the entire Library of Congress catalog, even though we could, because it's available as linked data, right? We could today double the size of Wikidata by just mass ingesting everything. But we're not doing that. 
even though usually we're quite happy to ingest stuff, right? But we're not doing that because we understand that we haven't figured it out yet. We don't have a good enough ontology for all the cases we want to support in all the different languages. Remember, we're, we're global, so it's not even just you know, the American way of cataloging. We need to somehow uh, you know, accommodate everything. So that's, that's an example of where we did kind of took a pause, and we're actually still thinking about it. So this is a good place for those of you interested in this to join. There's, there's on the Wikidata, there's a page called Wikidata Book Task Force or something like that, um, or Bibliographic Task Force or something. And, and of course, the Wikisite conference that some of you may have heard of uh, was another big step in the way, although that had a scholarly communications uh, focus. Uh, it does touch, of course, on many of the uh, same problems. Uh, and once we do figure this out, we will, we will, um, we will set some kind of more or less, um, it's not quite rigid than, I don't know, strongly suggested ontology for bibliographic objects that new contributors will be expected to adhere to, but will not be forced to because it's a wiki, right? I mean, they won't actually absolutely have to model everything exactly that way. There may be bots, there may be warnings, there may be things that will encourage them to do so. Yeah. And just an example of how we're actually hitting new horizon or new frontiers that even no one before has ever hit, especially for this area of, of um, firearms cartridges. You have some folks who know military cartridges very well, some know hunting cartridges really well, some know personal handgun cartridges, but no one kind of knows the entire space. So it's kind of the first time when all these things have come together in one location. That's where in Wikidata we're kind of hitting new I wouldn't say problems, but new modeling issues in that you never had to resolve this hunting cartridge family with this military <laughs> application and these handgun cartridges, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And so Andrew is now a world authority on <laughs> Only because I'm like deep dove into this aspect over here. I was just gonna say, this like really kind of, the last example illustrates how like the Wikidata model is a polar opposite of like formal ontology model <laughs> because you know, e even in RDFS, which isn't like OWL, there is the idea that something is a class or not. And here you basically have a person making a statement, this is a class and this is an instance. Yeah, but we like eradicated this. It's so. an in <laughs> I know, but like, you can do that. You and can. And in OWL, you, that would generate, like OWL full, that would generate uh, an inconsistency. And But you know, it's like totally <laughs> fine. Oh, well, I mean, it's not fine, but it's totally doable without Right. Consequence and so like you know usually if you build an ontology then everybody sticks with it but here if you if you said I'm going to take this as my ontology and somebody clicks a button then something that was an instance yesterday becomes a class today and that's like a really different <laughs> outlook from formal ontology modeling. Right, that's right. Can I ask an extension of that to that comment? Um, so the, the the thought process that's developing with the uh, you know, bibliographic model, um, are there like further checks? on it if, if something like this happens in that domain? Or is it just going to be like the same sort of thing where it'll, it'll be data to reconcile? Uh, you mean, are there going to be limitations on how you can input data to Wikidata? Yeah, like, so, um, sorry, no, it, it's, no, it's, it's, it's unlikely that Wikidata itself, the platform, will ever prevent you from modeling nonsense, <laughs> right? Or, or from modeling things that are contradictory or uh -huh. You know, uh, an instance that is also a subclass, etc. Yeah. But um, Wikidata as a platform is is just the, the the platform. We can build any number of applications on top of it. For example, we can easily imagine some kind of bibliographic data ingestion application that will be custom built to feed in bibliographic data according to that best practice ontology okay. we will come up with, and that will be a way to you know, to direct contributions to follow that uh, that ontology, which otherwise would be kind of invisible yeah. on Wikidata. You don't see all these discussions we've had about how to model things. They are in the Wikidata projects and kind of on the side, but the, the platform itself doesn't prompt you and tell you, oh, it looks like you're, you know, like Microsoft's old Clippy. You know, it looks like you're modeling a book. You probably <laughs> want to look at this ontology. You know, we don't have that. Right. Is, is um, the, is, are there like working drafts of this thing? Or is it more of, of the ontology? Yeah. Yes, yes, that, um, this, this page here. Uh, Wiki Project Books is what it's called. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Well, I can see how um, it's always going to be open, but uh, because you know, that's the, the trade-off of being a wiki. Um, so some, somebody can decide something to suck uh, an 
statistics or a subclass. But there are some sort of fairly fundamental rules of taxonomies which could be imposed, so they can't be both. So if somebody decides, I want to edit this statement and uh, make this thing uh, that was previously classified as a subclass of X and decide it's an instance of, rather than adding that in statements, the system ought to be able to say, it can't be both. Um, so you know, we talked about constraints at all? We talked a little bit about constraints, so that would be the constraint for it, yeah. yeah. Right. I, just, I just found one. Super, super continent is listed as a subclass of continent, <laughs> which can't be true. <laughs> Well, arguably, it is a subclass of continent in the sense of it's a type of continent. Mm -hmm. That's not what I meant. I, I was talking about a, a more mechanistic thing, where something can't be both yeah, so, sort of subclass. Right. Yeah. So we do have constraints in Wikidata, right. which, which, is a, which is a way, uh, they're mostly at the property level. So you can say about a certain property, when this property exists, we expect this other property not to exist. Right or not to have a value, or, you know, um, I don't know, um, um, number of children is expected to be an integer. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we do have constraints like that. And right now, constraints result in warnings, you know, little exclamation marks that mm -hmm. are encouraging you to pay attention. Uh, but they usually, most of them won't prevent you from putting in the data. But you can also define constraints that will refuse to accept the data. As you said, the, the, the wiki trade-off tends to be, go ahead and do it, we'll talk about it if we disagree, rather than we will not let you do it, possibly excluding some edge case. You know? So we tend towards the, the flexible. Yeah, yeah. so uh, you, we now have a constraint section for a property, and you can specify what must be there, or what, what if there's a symmetric uh, property that needs to be there. So for example, I says it has part, and I said dolphin. I'm gonna get in trouble. And then it's going to go, uh, is it going to reload? No, oh, it doesn't. Well, I don't know if it will be immediately. These are not generated in real time. That's true. But it will, it will have a little thing here saying that um, dolphin should be part of this. So it should have this kind of symmetric property going back the other way. Let me get rid yeah, of that. Or spouse, right? If A is spouse of B, you expect B to be spouse of A. Right. right. So they're kind of advisory rather than hard constraints. <laughs> yeah, Hillary? For one, one last quick example of, of how what you might assume is reasonable is not. Uh, you might say, for example, let's have a constraint that uh, death year can be no later than, I don't know, 150 years from birth year. Right? That sounds reasonable. Until you think about the fact that we also model fictional characters. Some or of tortoises. Whom, some of whom, oh yeah, and tortoises. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so you know, at, at first blush, it's like, yeah, that should always be true. But no. <laughs> Yes. So you just talked about the properties you could you could have constraints. Um, I'm also wondering if you choose um, when you do the an instance of taxing, would it also constrain what properties can you use? For example, if I'm choosing I'm describing a person, I see that person is an instance of a human. Mm -hmm. Would I be constrained on what properties can I use or I can use any properties? Sometimes you'll be warned about it but you won't be you won't be rejected outright okay. right so for some reason we have a constraint that if some if some company is located in the administrative entity of something it can't have a headquarters statement at the same time I don't know why that is but someone made that determination so you should only have one of these type of statements you shouldn't have both of those type of statements so we do have the possibility of putting that into the constraint of a property You could, 
you could describe a person and then add the, I don't know, population and anthem properties. <laughs> Most people do not have an anthem, uh, and population is kind of meaningless about a human, but you could do that. You'll probably get, eventually, once the bot runs, you'll get a little constraint violation and say, hmm, that probably isn't what you meant. And you are kind of, you or someone else is encouraged to fix that, but you won't be prevented from making the error. So our users alerted They're, they're not. They're constraint reports. <laughs> yeah, but no, the user wouldn't see them unless they know about constraint reports. Right. So no, that's that's a weakness for sure. Because A, it's not real time, and B, even subsequently when the bot finds it, it doesn't go and find out who made the edit to make them know. Yes. You know so, right. uh, although it could. So what happens normally is when you start typing in a property here, it's going to try to suggest the ones that are most likely for that item, but it will also match anything even if it's nonsensical as well. It's going to prioritize ones that are most relevant to humans, but then anything is available as well. So I, I don't, it's, I don't think we have. Oh, here, here's a constraint violation right here. So yeah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. So this says ethnic group English people, but ethnic group, right? Making assertions about people's ethnic group is a is a sensitive, fraught issue. We can always assume that you know because a person is a citizen of X, or because of their skin color, they are ethnic group, whatever. And so, very sensibly, we say, no, that's the kind of thing we would only accept with a reference, right? Uh, likewise, uh, sexual orientation, right? It's the kind of thing you don't want to assert about someone without a reference. Right, and then we have all these constraint reports here. You can you can even, like, have a whole evening of your contribution to Wikidata just fixing constraint violations just by browsing this <laughs> and diving into that. Yeah, it somehow it does float some people's boat to fix those things. You never know. Okay, so let's show you one last thing of what we did here. Um, with oh, one, one last thing that's useful for you folks for spreadsheet tools. So this is something that most people may not know about. But how many people here use Google Spreadsheets in some way? Good. How many people have ever added like a module or an extension to Google Spreadsheets? Ah, you, good. So you may not know, but you can actually extend Google Spreadsheets with JavaScript written code that other people can contribute. So there actually is one that's really cool called Wikipedia and Wikidata tools. So if you're in Google Spreadsheets, it's in the, let's go ahead and make a new one here. It's in the menu there, and you only have to enable it once. After you enable it, then any spreadsheet you make has this as capability. But you go under here and say add-ons, and you say get add-ons right here. And then you go ahead and type in Wikipedia. I think it's the only thing that's Wikipedia related. Well, not exactly, but Wiki, probably only Wikidata one. Let's say Wikidata. Yeah, it's the only one there. So I already installed it, so it's not going to give me the option, but you can go ahead and install it. And so now it's available to any spreadsheet that you make. And then the cool thing is now it's here where you can actually show the documentation. It gives you a list of all the formulas that are Wikipedia and Wikidata friendly, which is pretty cool. So you can actually insert a formula into a spreadsheet cell that would do a live API query against Wikidata or so that could be really useful, right? So um, if you go in here and let's say, oh, yeah. let's auto translate. <laughs> uh, what do we auto translate? Um, where's the auto translate? Wiki, wiki translate. Oh, wiki translate. Okay, so wiki translate. So this basically shows you all the different Wikipedia editions that have an article for Cupcake. And it's actually hit the API and brought back all the language editions like that. So you have a whole bunch of functions here that are useful. Some are Wikidata oriented, some are Wikipedia oriented. And this is kind of like a poor person's open refine in some ways, that you've got to roll your own, like you have your list and you want to query against Wikidata, does this match? or does this exist in Wikipedia or Wikidata, and you can do it this way, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So one of the most useful things I find in Google Spreadsheets is being able to constrain values to look up elsewhere in the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. You can figure this to look up in Wikidata, so for example, have a column which will only accept instances of some item in Wikidata. Is that gonna work with that? Uh, 
time with me. I, can't I think run. you. I think you could. You could. I think you could, for example, create a new sheet, run a Wikidata query through that formula, get the results of, let's say, you want a Wikidata query for, I don't know, country names, yeah. and then design a what's it called, VLOOKUP or whatever, you know, and and you know, map that to the values. You there. think it's a two-stage process? Yeah. So as far as far as the lookup field in, in the spreadsheet is concerned, you're just referencing other cells. How did you get the data to the other cells is through these API right. calls. But you, you could, yeah, you could do quite sophisticated things with this. And the power, the power comes into uh, view when you, you know, run the, the same formula on whatever five thousand items, right? So, so you figure out, I don't know, how to how to how to write a person's name in, in Arabic or Japanese, a script you you don't you know know. Uh, mm -hmm. You can rely on Wiki, Wikipedia and the interlinks, right, to give you those names. You could put that on column B, column C. Add in column D, uh, I don't know, the average page views per day, which you can get through here, all kinds of things like that, and then run that for 5,000 names that you have. It's tons of work that were done for you without right. coding. Right. So there's all kinds of neat things you can yeah. do there. Coordinates. Yeah, you can look up coordinates like that, um, stuff that you could only really do with like Google type of APIs before. Now you can just do it straight through there. So. Um, it's nice that this is all open source, so I've actually written a few more functions that don't exist here, just because you know the creator of this uploaded the code to GitHub, I just copied the code, modified the API call a little bit, and I can do new calls to Wikidata that he didn't put in here. Right. So in fact, I think this, this list has gotten longer over the last few months. He said he's actually added some more things here, which is cool. So if I have, let me see if I can show you one example. So I've actually collaborated with folks um, at museums and libraries on how to upload things to this. Let me show one example here. That is, oh, here we go. And this is even tapping into something that's even more uh, cool that we haven't shown you before, but there is something called a ORS reading. So it's basically a machine learning algorithm that can kind of give you a predicted quality of a Wikipedia article. Um, so a no human has to review it and say this is a B class or A class or C class or a featured article. It can actually go in there with the algorithm say I predict this is a C quality level and it's pretty darn good um, just by looking at some markers including how many references and writing style and things like that. So this is a work list that we had worked on with the uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library I think here. And this is basically grabs not only the wiki data ID but it also does a calculation on the quality. It does like probably peppering wiki data and Wikipedia with 100, 200 API calls, so it's taking some time to come back. But the nice thing about this, we can work with probably like up to 100 to 200 items at a time. Once you go beyond 200 items with this, you're just like machine gunning the API, and it's probably gonna not crash, but just time out on a lot of stuff. If you wanna go beyond this, probably open refine is your friend or a Python script. But for light 50 to 200 item uh, tasks, this is a pretty nice way to do things, it's just using um, the formulas in Wiki spreadsheets, I'm sorry, Google spreadsheets to do this. So we'll wait for that to come back and see if it makes it back. All right, so the functions you have are here in the Google spreadsheets. And if you want some of the functions that I've created, you can go to um, here. So I have some extra ones here. If you go into the spreadsheet, I'm sorry, go into the Google slides. I've actually written some extra functions that get you that, that revision score, that ORA score, that automatically rates Wikipedia articles. There. Okay, let me see if I have one last thing. Okay, so let me just show you what we did with the cartridges and the Wikidata Graph Builder. So this is kind of the before shot, and it's kind of hard to just say that this is not a healthy um, taxonomy, but it's a, not a healthy taxonomy, in that it's basically everything clustered around the top level cartridge like this. And we actually want to move a lot of these down into subclass. So basically, there's all these different cartridges that say subclass of cartridge, but they actually should be subclass of pistol cartridge, subclass of rifle cartridge, subclass of shotgun cartridge. We should actually have multiple hierarchical layers here. And the idea here is to move these out and down to the lower layers here. Right. So this is just before we cleaned up the ontology, we said, show me all cartridges and subclasses and it showed how far these things went down. Right. So this is after some cleanup, we start to move some things out, and we also went in and looked at 
uh, leaves of this where there was just a Q number and start to fill these in. And the nice thing about cartridges, it's not really language specific. If you say you're a 10 millimeter uh, cartridge, it's 10 millimeter in any language pretty much, right? So it's just a matter of someone hadn't copied that value up to the different language editions. Okay, so that's something that we did in the cleanup there. And then another thing you can do is also make similar graphs like that, but in Wikidata Query itself. So Wikidata Graph Builder is its own tool, but you can also do a lot of the same things with Sparkle in Wikidata Graph Builder. I'm mean, sorry, in Wikidata Query. So if I go ahead and run that query, you'll see this is it live. It's kind of nuts. As I said, you need a pretty powerful computer. If you run this on a Chromebook, it might kind of crunch. Uh, but you need some memory, you need some CPU. But you can see this is showing you kind of the robustness of the, uh, the uh, ontology right now because we've actually separated all these cartridges into their kind of subclasses here. And you can actually zoom in and see here. See rifle cartridge right there. And if you go over here, you'll see just generic cartridge. And probably a lot of these things need to be moved down to their subclasses. And then here's pistol cartridges right there. All right, so this is kind of a healthier grouping now than what we had before of everything just blooming like a dandelion off of the, uh, the original base cartridge class there. Okay, another thing you can do, which is just cool, is that if you grab the images back, you can also animate the images in this thing too. So one thing that we showed here is we want to say, you know, these, these cartridges never really appear out of nowhere. It's this cartridge was made in 1903, and then this is based on that one in 1911, and then this one was based on that in 1923, and there's actually a whole family tree of cartridges, which is pretty cool. And it's really hard to find anyone who's done this on the net in any serious way. But the nice thing is once you've modeled it, you can actually do it in Wikidata Query. So you can see all the kind of evolutions of these different cartridges by just following these different paths there. Of course, it starts to get really crowded because they're all different size images there. But you can kind of see here how different cartridges are interrelated. So this is all with the statement or the property based on. You can say this cartridge based on that cartridge, right? So you have the subclass tree, but you also have the based on property, and this is what we're traversing right now and showing it here. So you can see what were the most influential cartridges? Well, the nine millimeter is pretty influential because look at all the other cartridges that are based on that. But it itself was not out of nowhere. It was based on this cartridge, which is based on this cartridge, and you can kind of see the whole lineage of that cartridge there. So this is kind of the original German cartridges that gave birth to the nine millimeter that is so popular today. Okay, so this is code you can borrow to see if you want to look at any other kinds of things in Wikidata that use this kind of uh, linkage here based on or any other type of property that does that. And then the, if you want to see the really impressive example, this is in the examples folder. You can see the evolution of music genres. This is really going to crunch your browser. Let me get rid of this before I kill my machine. So this is drawing out all the different musical genres. Yikes. I'm not sure that's going to recover from that, so. I usually like to go to the Apple store and get their most powerful computer and run this on it to see if it responds, because I don't think I can do much with that. It's just too big. So, so that's in the examples query um, in Wikidata query. All right. All right, so that's mostly what I wanted to show you. Um, are there any other questions from folks? Yes. I may have missed this, but did you share with us how to get your slides? Uh, yes, so let me, it's a good question. Let me go back to the front here. You can either scan that QR code or you can go to uh, bit.ly slash ld4 2019 wikidata2. And they should be linked from the program? I don't know if it is. No? We can put it in. There's, there's that G drive for all the presentations. Yeah, yeah, we should put it in there. Okay, any questions from folks? Yes? This is probably a really unfair question with three minutes left. <laughs> just close one from OCLC, so I always question about scale. So, you know, I was thinking about even if OCLC and LC were subtracted from this, the institutions collectively at this conference, if we all went back and 
start identifying all of our stuff and creating triples for all of our stuff, right? It would, you know, be orders of magnitude bigger than the current wiki data. So, you know, how does how does Wikimedia see this scaling? That's a great question. I mean, this is something that we were talking about before. Look at this. This is the size of Wikidata right now, and this slice, which I think is uh, down here. Scholarly articles now make up 42% of Wikidata. And that's just probably the effect of what? A handful of people just doing that, right? So you're right, the Wikidata could easily be overrun with just a few institutions saying, we're gonna upload our collection to Wikidata. Right? So that's part of what we need to think about in terms of Wikisite, right? A citation database, and should all these scholarly articles live here in Wikidata next to basic you know, objects and modeling uh, that we want to do with Wikidata, or should it be its own citation database, and should we have different types of databases? Um, I don't know what the answer is, Asaf, do you have it? I'll, I'll say that we think that's a good problem to have. <laughs> um, and we have some track record. I mean, we do run the fifth most viewed website on the planet. We have experience with scale. We have the Wikimedia Commons, which has about 60 million media objects, some of them huge. I, I forget how many petabytes that is, but you know, it, and I, I also forget the growth rate, but it's something amazing on the order of uh, several terabytes per day. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we build these kinds of things. Uh, we may not be ready today to have all of y'all upload all your <laughs> metadata, but uh, we, we want to talk about it at least, and, and we will be ready. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last one, and then we gotta go. Um, so, this is kind of a similar technical question, but like my understanding is that Wikidata is built on BlazeGraph and like the BlazeGraph developers all move to AWS. So it, is that like what is Blaze yeah, am I right about <coughs> this? That this is built on BlazeGraph and what yes. is what's the future of BlazeGraph if is is it open source enough that people are just developing it now or that is my understanding, but actually I don't have an authority to answer for you on that. I'm not involved with the technical development of Wikidata. But yes, it's correct that we're using BlazeGraph for the query, only for the query. Yeah. Right. Wikidata yeah. itself is not BlazeGraph. Right. Right. Uh, but but, but run queries Sparkle. run on, yeah, our Sparkle endpoint is powered by BlazeGraph. And yes, it has been kind of abandoned by its original team. Uh, my understanding is that a, a bunch of uh, engineers have taken it up. Okay. And our, our thinking, I think, is the stage right now. They're thinking about, do we just continue to own and evolve this product as a, some kind of consortium? Or sh should we do a gap analysis with other solutions or what? And I don't know more than that to, to tell you. But, yeah. um, but, we, but our search engineers are, are involved and are part of that group. So whatever happens with BlazeGraph, we will either be part of or we will transition away from it like the others. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for coming. <laughs> Feel free to get in touch with me or Asaf if you have anything um, that you're interested in talking about. Thanks. And what was our next session? 3.30 or 3.15? 3.30. Good. That was a good break. Stop it, Andrew? Yes, thank you so much.